An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. The genuine expression. The sermon. Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, we will go through bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect. Your common building style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. honesty. Which invites you. To be you to the fullest. Hi there, this is Dave Kelso, and welcome to yet another edition of Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy. Um, I would like to talk about and show you and present to you the idea that. Christianity is actually starting to wake up. Now, if you're like me, then your parochial school experience might have been more of the hell brimstone, fire, and low self-esteem type, um, telling you that you're nothing, and you're worthless, and you can't do anything, and you're miserable, and, and you need to beat yourself up with guilt for the rest of your life. And, um, well, Rochelle D. Young has shown me, um, a video of her pastor, um, Pastor Thomas Fitzpatrick. And this guy is awesome. I don't fully agree with everything he says, but let's just say 90% at least. And the 90% that I saw... I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't know if he realizes it, but he's talking about quantum physics. Especially when he's talking about how science is proof of God and so on and so forth. And um, this is not your typical fire and brimstone pastor. And he's talking about, you know, exploring the nature of the universe and how it can be exciting and how that, that excitement, that passion, and that desire can lead to really, really good, positive, productive things. It doesn't have to, you know, be all this, this nasty, dark, yucky stuff or whatever. So, I'm not only going to be showing you a really awesome, awakened pastor, I'm hoping that this pastor one day sees this, because Mr. Fitzpatrick, we're about to go down the rabbit hole of quantum physics. And I'm going to use quantum physics to prove Jesus Christ. So, hang on to your hats. That the human heart, your heart, is a ceaseless factory of desires. See, all of us at one level or another, we crave and we hunger for things. Things like love, intimacy, power, beauty. And everything we do, from the good, to the bad, to the ugly, to the stuff we don't share, all of that, I think, can be traced back to one of those seven core longings, to one of those seven core desires. You are literally driven by these desires. And yet most non-Christians assume that God has nothing good to say about these desires. And most Christians assume that to be good, God doesn't want you to have anything to do with these desires. For one reason or another, a lot of Christians begin to think and feel the same way that I thought when I first started following Jesus, and that is that there is no place in my pursuit of God for my deepest desires. And in fact, I will please God to the degree that I deny myself those desires. As a Christian, I'm supposed to desire things like prayer and Bible studies and harp-infused worship music. Nothing against the harp, but I'm supposed to have these really pure, holy, godly desires, nothing like I once 
had. I have to stop desiring all that I once did. But here's the thing. You just can't pull that off. You just can't do that. You can't repent of those desires and you shouldn't actually try to turn away from those desires because those desires are given to you from God and they're designed to draw you actually closer to God. See, these desires, I think, give us a glimpse into what it means to be created in the image of an amazing God. These desires are God's fingerprints on you. It's how you've literally been hardwired and designed. He designed you with desires. He created you with cravings. And he doesn't want you to turn away from them now. So the problem lies not in the depth of our desires, but in the, in the destructive ways that we go about seeking satisfaction to them. Right, it should come as no surprise to us that a beautiful God would make beautiful creatures that want to be beautiful. It should come as no surprise to us that a loving God would make lovely beings that want to experience the depths of love. It should come as no surprise to us that a powerful God would make powerful creatures that want to be powerful. And I don't think I'm alone in this desire, right? From the little toddler who constantly complains, I'm bored to the billionaire who's trying to, for a, a small fee, take you to the moon. All of us want to be thrilled in one way or another, right? All of us want to be excited and amazed and enthralled. We're going to symbolize it today by this huge box right here. J.J. Abrams, if you know him, he's a director of a lot of sci-fi movies and TV shows, including my favorite, Lost. He says when he was a little boy, his grandfather bought him a little black box, a little black magic box with a big question mark on it. And he says, it was actually more fun to sit there and wonder what was inside of the box than to ever actually open the box and be disappointed. So even today, as an older man, he's got a little black box that he keeps on his desk as inspiration to create fascinating things. Because it's all about what's in the box. What, what, what could possibly be in here? What is this like? And, and what is there for me to enjoy and experience? What could possibly happen? Can you relate to this desire? Am I speaking nonsense or do, you, or do you resonate with this a little bit? Do you want to be amazed? Do you want to be excited? Do you want to be enthralled? Do you ever want to be fascinated? Oh, I know that I do. I think that everybody does it. That's why we hold up and idolize athletes because they do things on the court or on the field that we could never do and they amaze us. That's why we flock to the movies and drop 40 bucks on a handful of popcorn because we want Hollywood to blow us away. We want to see California fall off the face of the earth because of the San Andreas fault. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed your time. It's no longer there. Right? We want to do these. We, we, we're crazed consumers. Why? Because there's something, something so fascinating about a faster car, a faster computer, a larger TV, a bigger house that intrigues us, that excites us, and so we buy it. That's why we're adrenaline junkies. So we climb 14ers and we jump out of planes and we strap two pieces of metal to our feet and we go down an icy slope. Why? Because we want to be amazed. We want to be fascinated. We want to be excited. We desire to be fascinated. We want to know what's in here. We want to see something amazing. We've been hardwired this way. It seems like a fascinating God has made fascinating creatures who want to be fascinated. All of us, whether introvert, extrovert, rich, poor, male, female, Christian, non-Christian, extreme sports junkie, or couch potato, all of us want to be amazed. We want to see and behold the incredible. We go to the box. It's got to be in the box. It's in this box. The, the desire I have to be fascinated is in here. The Lord's like, no, it's not. It's in here. It's in my hands. It's in my presence. Stop looking to the box. Stop wondering and wishing and hoping something amazing is going to pop out of the box. I mean, don't you think that God, as the creator of the cosmos, knows how to get crazy? Of course he does. I mean, don't you think that God, as the author of all that we see, can give you all you can handle and more? Don't you think that the eternal one has the ability to excite and blow away everyone? Of course he does. God does wonders without number, like the earth's perfect rotation. The earth's perfect placement and tilt from the sun. The complexities of cell biology. How in one strand of DNA in you is enough material to fill an entire Encyclopedia Britannica. Look it up online if you don't know what I'm talking about. How about astrophysics? How about chemical engineering? Our God does wonders without number. 
He is fascinating, and he's inviting you to discover all of these fascinating things. You want to be blown away by something? You want to be amazed? Then go discover the beauty and wonder of God's creation. Go unpack the things that he has laid out there for you to find. Think about Copernicus, Newton, Einstein. All they've done is unpack the amazing ways that God works. Science and religion are not at odds. They explain one another. They help make sense of each other. They don't disprove God. They give me more support for God. Science is the manifestation of God's order, God's might, God's power. It could be the size of the universe or the intricacy of a single cell. Everything proves to me that God is a fascinating God. We call him wonderful, don't we? You know why? Because he is full of wonder. He's wonderful. And I want you to be blown away by this God again. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, 
the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Can we solve the measurement problem, or has physics encountered consciousness? To understand the measurement problem, let's start with the basics. In the paper on decoherence and the measurement problem, Maximilian Schlahauser points out the problem we have in quantum mechanics. Particles exist normally in a superposition of possibilities, described by the wave function, which basically means, as Rosenblum and Kuttner point out, that particles normally exist as several mathematical possibilities rather than one actual object like how we experience them in reality. So how do particles go from a mathematical state of possibilities when we are not observing to one physical object when we observe? Well, this is the measurement problem. It seems in the absence of observation, particles exist in a superposition of possibilities rather than one actual thing. But when we observe them, they are not in such a state. Something happens when we look and causes this change. The wave function on its own, which describes these possibilities, is completely deterministic, but as Henry Stapp points out, it fails when an increment of knowledge occurs. Then there is a sudden jump to a reduced state, which represents the new state of knowledge. This jump involves the well-known element of quantum randomness. So something happens between these two states. As Schlosshauser points out, we are missing a mechanism of how this occurs. Thus, without supplying an additional physical process, say some collapse mechanism, or giving a suitable interpretation of such a superposition, it is not clear how to account, given the final composite state, for the definite pointer positions that are perceived as a result of an actual measurement, i.e., why do some seem to perceive the pointer to be in one position, but not in a superposition of positions? So how is it that what we observe is different than what the wave function actually describes? How is it that collapse happens to one definite state when we observe? The practical way this is carried out is through interaction with a particle or system of particles that has already collapsed. One can measure a particle with the use of a measuring apparatus and interact with it. This will cause collapse through interaction because the state of the particle has been disturbed. This is a decoherence effect, and some argue this can fully explain collapse on its own and solve the measurement problem. However, this doesn't really solve it because if we were to use one particle to collapse another, what was used to collapse that particle? And so on and so on. It was Niels Bohr that pointed out we cannot specify the wave function of an observed particle separately from the other particle that is used to measure it. In other words, the wave function of a particle cannot be unentangled from that of whatever is used to measure it, and so on and so on. Basically what this means is when one photon is measured by another, they entangle. If one particle measures another, it inherits part of its wave function, so to speak, and that particle, which is supposed to be measuring, cannot be fully explained without what it is measuring. So you need another measuring device to collapse that initial measuring particle to a definite state. But then you need something else to collapse that measuring apparatus as well, and so on and so on. This creates a chain of material objects in a superposition of measuring, which is known as a von Neumann chain. Since quantum laws are what truly describe all material objects, some other particle or measuring apparatus is always needed to collapse the next one in line. You keep going back until you get to something that would be non-local, outside the entire material system, which escapes this chain by not being bound by the same physical laws, and is able to cause final collapse of everything in the chain, which is argued to be a conscious observer, something beyond the material, with the ability to collapse the entire physical system. So this decoherence theory, the idea that physical interaction of particles in the environment will cause collapse without the input of a conscious observer, cannot solve the measurement problem. 
And advocates of decoherence theory openly admit decoherence alone cannot fully explain why there is a collapse to one definite state, or even derive the Born rule for that matter. Does decoherence solve the measurement problem? Clearly not. What decoherence tells us is that certain objects appear classical when they are observed, but what is an observation? At some stage, we still have to apply the usual probability rules of quantum theory. Claims that simultaneously the measurement problem is real and decoherence solves it are confused at best. Decoherence arises from a direct application of the quantum mechanical formalism to a description of the interaction of a physical system with its environment. By itself, decoherence is therefore neither an interpretation nor a modification of quantum mechanics. Now why would they say this? Well, many physicists, like G. Grubel, in his paper The Quantum Measurement Problem Enhanced, have pointed out initial state environmental effects cannot explain the occurrence of definite experimental outcomes. The environment lacks the ability to choose between the possibilities of the wave function and choose one to be actual. Plus, the environment is also described by the same quantum laws and has the same problems already specified. This is why Steven Adler says, decoherence in the absence of a detailed theory showing that it leads to stochastic outcomes with the correct properties has yet to achieve this status. Even in preferred states, predictability, classicality, and the environment-induced decoherence, Zurich refers to the observer being involved in the ultimate collapse. Something beyond the physical system, not described by quantum laws, needs to initiate this final or ultimate collapse. Stephen Barr explains it like this, the observer is not totally describable by physics. If we could describe the mathematics of quantum theory, everything that happened in a measurement from beginning to end, that is, even up to the point where a definite outcome was obtained by the observer, then the mathematics would have to tell us what the definite outcome was. But this cannot be, for the mathematics of quantum theory will generally yield only probabilities. The actual definite result of the observation cannot emerge from the quantum calculation. And that says something about the process of observation, and something about the observer eludes the physical description. So what is special about a conscious observer that the environment or the measuring apparatus cannot do? Well, apart from not being described by physical laws, the observer has the ability to put the right questions into nature and yield a result. As Henry Stapp says, the observer in quantum theory does more than just read the recordings. He also chooses which questions will be put into nature, which aspect of nature his inquiry will probe. I call this important function of the observer the Heisenberg choice. To contrast it, with the Dirac choice, which is the random choice on the part of nature that Dirac emphasized. According to quantum theory, the Dirac choice is a choice between alternatives that are specified by the Heisenberg choice. The observer must first specify what aspect of the system he intends to measure or probe, and then put in place an instrument that will probe that aspect. In quantum theory, it is the observer who both poses the question and recognizes the answer. Without some way of specifying what the question is, the quantum rules will not work. The quantum processes grind to a halt. The interaction chain stems back from an observer's ability to make a Heisenberg choice, which derives a random Dirac choice back from nature. This is how we get one actual outcome from the possibilities of the wave function. Only the observer has the ability to choose, give a Heisenberg choice, between possibilities. Non-conscious measuring devices cannot. John Gribben and Paul Davies say in their book, The Matter Myth, the observer plays a key role in deciding the outcome of the quantum measurements, the answers, and the nature of reality depend in part on the questions asked. They were, of course, building off of Niels Bohr, who once said in reply to Einstein, To my mind, there is no other alternative than to admit that, in the field of experience, we are dealing with individual phenomena, and that our possibilities of handling the measuring instruments allow us to make a choice between the different complementary types of phenomena we want to study. Denying the observer plays a fundamental role simply doesn't make sense, and the majority of physicists realize they have to accept this. A recent poll demonstrated that over 50% of physicists accept the observer plays a fundamental role in the application of the mathematical formalism, but then only 6% accept any physical role, which means they accept the math tells them one thing, but deny the philosophical conclusions from that math. And this really isn't justified or logical, especially if the mathematics can only make sense if the observer plays a fundamental role. Why deny the obvious conclusion that follows? Henry Stapp rightly points out why physicists deny this philosophical conclusion. It's metaphysical prejudice. Some are trying to hold to metaphysical beliefs about the world that quantum mechanics 
and the role of the observer challenge. One must ask whether it is really beneficial for scientists to renounce for all time the aim of trying to understand the world in which we live in order to maintain a metaphysical prejudice that arose from a theory, classical Newtonian mechanics and materialism, that is known to be fundamentally incorrect. The fundamental role of the observer is even harder to deny with the experimental confirmation of the Koch and Spector theorem in 2011. This shows that the outcome obtained by an experiment crucially depend on how the experiment is done, meaning we are not passive observers. Outcomes are happening based on what we input into nature. As one paper explained, the Koch and Spector theorem states that non-contextual theories are incompatible with quantum mechanics. Non-contextuality means that the value for an observable predicted by such a theory does not depend on the experimental context. So when we perform experiments, we are not just passively observing how nature progresses, but are actively affecting what the outcome will be by how we observe things. As they say in the New Scientist magazine, the values you obtain when you measure its properties depend on the context. So the value of property A, say, depends on whether you chose to measure it with property B or with property C. In other words, there is no reality independent of choice of measurement. So the Koch and Spector theorem directly demonstrates the outcome depends on what we experimentally put into it. As Anton Zellinger says, The Koch and Spector theorem talks about properties of one system only. So we know that we cannot, assume, to put it precisely, we know that it is wrong to assume that the features of a system which we observe in the measurement exist prior to the measurement. Not always, I mean in certain cases. So in a sense, uh, what we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure, which is a very, very deep uh, message about, about the nature of reality and about our role in the universe. We are not just passive observers. Thus the conclusion necessarily follows. The philosophical implications of the measurement problem cannot be ignored. As they say in the quantum enigma, quantum theory thus denies the existence of a physically real world independent of its observation. The measurement problem is only a problem if one cannot accept the observer plays a fundamental role in shaping physical reality. We are not passively observing the world, but actively involved. As Rosenblum and Kuttner say, physics has encountered consciousness, and our view of the universe will never be the same. God is fascinating, who he is, what he's made, what he's put here on this earth to help us discover or to give us to discover, it's all fascinating. But more than that, more than just a fascinating God who's made fascinating things, this morning I want to prove to you he's inviting you into the fascinating. He wants you to be a part of something fascinating. Look at John 14. He says this, Truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, Jesus said, will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. And I'll do whatever you ask in my name so the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus just said that we as believers, we as Christians, will do greater things than he did. Wait, did I just hear you right, Jesus? Greater things than you. Wait, you mean greater things than healing broken people? You mean greater things than illuminating the darkness? You mean greater things than multiplying food or walking on water or raising the dead to life? Greater things than that? I can be a part of that? You're inviting me into that? Yes, he says. You want to be fascinated? They want you to do greater things than I did, he says. But typically we read this passage and others like it and we cast it off, don't we? We say, ah, oh, this is fictitious. This is fabricated stuff. No, it's not. It's an invitation into the fascinating world of Jesus. It's not false. It's not fake. It's an invitation into the fascinating. What if, what if he was telling the truth there? What if that's real? What if that promise was given to us because he, he knew it could come to fruition? What if he is saying, you can be a part of an even greater work and ministry than what I was even a part of here on earth? What if that was true? In the beginning, there was nothing. Somehow, out of this nothing came everything. Out of this vibrant nothingness, matter, energy, space, time, consciousness, mind, emerged, came out. How is it that something as unconscious as the matter of the brain 
can ever give rise to something as immaterial as an experience. If you want to see fear in a quantum physicist's eyes, just mention the words, the measurement problem. The measurement problem is this. An atom only appears in a particular place if you measure it. In other words, an atom is spread out all over the place until a conscious observer decides to look at it. So the act of measurement or observation creates the entire universe. Only conscious beings can be observers, then we're intimately hooked in to the very existence of reality. Without us, there would just be this expanding superposition of possibilities with nothing definite ever actually happening. Out of millions and millions of blobs of energy and light, photons and electrons, they make up this uh, imaginary three-dimensional solid world which doesn't exist at all according to uh, relativity or quantum mechanics. Anytime we attempt to look at particles beyond a certain level, the very act of observation changes things. And in addition, the more you look at individual particles, the more you realize that there is no such thing as one electron. An electron or any elementary particle exists only in relationship to other things, like other particles or, or the universe at large. This means that, that deeply enough, when you de dive down into the nature of matter, everything we know about the, the everyday world dissolves. There are no objects anymore, there are only relationships. There's no locality anymore, there's no time anymore. The more you look at something in detail, in what we think of as solid matter, the less and less solid it begins to look. The only realities we know are the ones our brain manufactures. Our brain receives millions of signals every minute and we organize them into holograms which we project outside ourselves and call reality. Well, if the brain cortex, uh, if it is also a hologram, then it's a three-dimensional hologram. If two-dimensional holograms reconstruct three-dimensional images, then, ergo, it follows that three-dimensional holograms reconstruct a hologram is a metaphor. It is how you take n dimensions of information and you bring them down into n minus one dimensions. It's a way of relating the paradoxes that we find in how to make a leap from this concept to that concept. The conceptual pigeonholes we use, words, to, to describe reality are phenomena inside our head. They're not out there. And most of the time, this is a philosophical quibble. When, but when you get down to quantum physics, and this is one of the reasons that Bohm came up with the holographic idea, it, it starts to have real effects. And one of those is it's been discovered that if you take uh, two subatomic particles like electrons, in certain instances, when you do something to one, it will always affect the other, no matter how far apart they are. Well, how can this be? But what this tells us is that once matter is physically joined, even when it becomes separate, the energy is still there that's connecting it. And this is why it's important to me, because if we go back far enough in time, all the particles of matter of this entire universe that are expanding were all meshed together in a single particle about the size of a green pea, is what scientists tell us today, is what the computer models suggest. That if you could go into the universe today and take all the particles of matter and take out all the space in between and bring it together and compress it into a size of a single green pea, it means that you and me and every one of our listeners, we were all once part of that same particle that creates this whole universe today. And even though those particles are now separate and expanding, and, and studies show that they are, energetically we're all still linked. So an atom and its electron are multiversal objects. And that multiversal object is what the quantum mechanics is describing. Now, that means that the parallel universe aspect of reality, as described by quantum theory, must apply to objects of all sizes, humans, stars, galaxies, everything. And that's why we call it the parallel universe theory, rather than just parallel electrons theory because we ourselves are made of atoms after all. We are, and, and uh, that's right, and the same theory that says that the atoms exist in more than one place in different universes says that we humans also exist in more than one place and in more than one state of mind and so forth in different universes. And so what that means, talking about words, is that there is no separation between electrons. Furthermore, there's no separation between people. Everything is interconnected and 
biggest secret of all, to me, is the extent to which individuality is an illusion. Illusion comes from how our minds perceive. My illusion comes from my mind. Your illusion comes from your mind. You do not need to search, you do all, not need to search anywhere the, else for the source of illusion. Wherever we search externally, we cannot find the source of illusion because your illusions come from within your mind. The big thing we're talking about here is a new way of thinking about this thing we call the person, the self, the beingness, the I. And as we begin to modify what we mean by that, we can begin to see and touch upon this infinite realm that I'm speaking about. Infinities are part of the boundary of your existence. That is, viewed from this perspective, everything can be divided to infinity. If you've ever wondered why nuclear power is a million times more powerful than chemical energy, it's because chemical energy results from the manipulation of atoms in a molecule. Nuclear energy results from the manipulation of nucleons in a nucleus. The super unified scale, a thousand, million, million, million times smaller, is virtually infinite in its dynamism. If you're seeking the infinite, what instruments do you have to seek the infinite? Only sense organs, isn't it? So through your sense organs, if you're seeking the infinite, it is like wanting to go to moon with a bullock cart. Isn't it so? That is the plight of humanity right now. With a limited perception, they're trying to grasp that is which is beyond. So we try to perceive at the ultimate level of reality, and we search for any kind of method. For example, new technology, atomic power, etc. But search as we might, we cannot perceive the ultimate level of reality using these mechanisms. The ultimate level of reality is fundamentally empty, we cannot find and it not observable true. using these scientific methods. Yeah. Science is involved in a perceptual enterprise, not, in, not primarily in gaining knowledge, though knowledge appears, but knowledge is a byproduct. Uh, and by understanding the thing, you can coherently let our contact with it as long as it is coherent. It shows that our understanding is correct. You see, we must distinguish between correct appearances and incorrect appearances or illusory. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This, this is real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Our brains take information in and sometimes give it a form. It's not that the picture is out there, it's that we're getting data that we're turning into a picture according to our own belief systems and our own unconscious belief systems as well. We know what is going on is that light comes in through the eyes, hits the back of the retina, triggers electrochemical impulses which travel down nerve fibers to the back of the brain where the brain very cleverly in about a tenth of a second puts it all together and says this is what it looks like out here well uh, you're creating your own reality tunnel that doesn't mean you're creating reality uh, out, out of reality whatever that is out of the infinite flux of energy you're creating your own uh, reality tunnel and uh, uh, most people aren't aware of it most people are unaware of it all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively there is no such thing as death life is only a dream and we are the imagination of ourselves Paul in the book of Ephesians says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that power is now in us the resurrection power of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God's breath, God's life, God's fire, it's in us. So you want to be fascinated? You want to be blown away? All right, then Mark 11. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Fictitious? 
false, fabricated, or how about an invitation into the fascinating? You wanna be part of something crazy? Then why don't you pray really hard that crazy things happen?